You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Peter Heffelen, uh, Policy Director of the Wilfried Manter Centers for European Studies in Brussels. And Dr. Heffela, thank you for being here with us. Uh, you have an extensive um, professional past, so to speak, working for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, now the Wilfried Matter Center, working both in Bra- yes, uh, now in Brussels and in the past in Asia, in China. Um, could you speak a little bit about your current, uh, prof- what you are doing now in Brussels and how do you see everyday work in Brussels? Well, let's be first of all, thank you very much for this kind of invitation and this grandiose idea of this MCC Fest combining culture, music and politics. I think it's a unique opportunity to, to attract people and to open to people who normally do not deal with politics, which is often a problem also in my business. And I would like to take that point indeed to say what we are currently doing. I'm working with the Philip Wilfred Martin Center. That's the official think tank of the European People's Party, the largest party in the European Parliament. We do research, we do advice for politicians, we have a vast network of partner foundations in Europe, and of course dealing with international politics, and that's where I come from. As you mentioned, I lived 10 years in Asia, mostly in the Chinese world, but of course I've gone beyond. I did a lot in the field of energy and climate as well, as topics I think we are discussing here quite extensively, and it's, well, you have just to see out the window, that's a big issue how to deal with this global crisis. Definitely. That would be my first question then about the current situation, that seeing the situation now in our neighborhood, the war in Ukraine and its implication on security policy, energy, does this overshadow everything else? According to you, you come from Brussels, so you see firsthand the discussion, ongoing debates. So does this mean that the discussions on the future of Europe or European integration are now pushed to the background? or these negotiations are still ongoing? How, how is it? Well, first of all, I hope not, and it will not. I'm quite sure, following closer the discussions, things are so interlinked, so you can't separate these things. Of course, now the immediate response to the war in Ukraine is something which we have to deal, and Europe did quite well performing, uh, better than everybody expected, uh, including the Russians. I think otherwise they probably had not come to that stage, but uh, it has triggered a lot of developments and speed up a lot of developments. The need for an energy transition is more than obvious. Um, it will probably indeed speed up the process. It is painful. It will be expensive. We will be see a lot of social protest, I'm quite sure. But nonetheless, it has shown that reducing the dependency on, in particular, fossil energy is absolutely key priority. We have to diversify, we have to strengthen European uh, strategies to, for a shared market, for example, to be more resilient, that not one country suffers very much. And I follow very closely the discussions here in Hungary as well. I know that you, as Germany as well, is very much dependent. But it is only solvable if we work together and, and extend our networks diversify and speed up. It is not one way, by the way. So we have to acknowledge and accept there are different ways in different countries. This is something which is sometimes a bit underestimated in Brussels, to say the least. It is good to have a framework, but then let's find solutions in the respective countries or even below the national state. So in communes, for example, in regions, Europe is a a regional entity and close border cooperation is not just between national states. It is between federal states uh, or regions. That has all been very effective, by the way. Definitely. On the other hand, the question of energy has brought together Europe more. We, we might say that there are, there are some differences still, but the, an, agree, an agreement was reached. On the other hand, the question of the war in Ukraine causes some divide in, in the Union. Uh, how do you see regional cooperation or inter-European cooperation in this regard? Um, is it a solvable challenge for Europe or or the majority, as the majority voting is now in place, the majority will will bring the EU forward in a direction? 
Well, first of all, the question, what is Europe and where is Europe and to which border is Europe has been brought now. Uh, we have delayed uh, extension in access processes for a long time. We have come up with the question how to deal with Ukraine, for example, Moldova, Georgia as well, but the Balkans next to us here and are waiting in the pipe for sometimes 15 years. So we have to find new ways. Maybe this is time also to discuss different uh, models that what we have perceived for so far is not the way into the future. The discussion what Europe should look like. Is it one constitution which fits for all? Or do we have to differentiate? There are different discussions and models right out. I personally think that we have to adjust these processes, that these huge um, accession processes will last for sometimes 15 years have come to an end. This does not serve our strategic interests. We have to find different modes. We have to support the countries in a different way. So this, the question of Europe is back on the table and we have to find answers. And not, sometimes it's not the whole union which has to find answers. I'm quite convinced that we will have alliances within the union to find concrete solutions. We have different interests. We have to acknowledge this. There's not one fits all approach. And it's not just the Eastern neighborhood or the Southern uh, Eastern neighborhood, which matters. With all these problems in the East, we forget that, for example, North Africa is of absolutely strategic importance. There's a lot of interest in doing more with Europe, but European policy has largely ignored it or left it to the, say, the Spain, Spanish or the, the Italians, which is something for all of Europe, not just for those countries who are just neighboring these regions. On the other hand, we could also see in the past that certain EU member states had a preferential approach towards certain regions. For example, France was also pushing for a EU North Africa uh, cooperation format. The Central European countries, most notably Poland, were pushing for a more Eastern, a bigger um, green light for the Eastern Partnership. Hungary was supporting the integration of the Western Balkan states. Is this a cooperative? Is this a useful thing? That's that I see no contradiction in this because you have historical ties, you have special knowledge, you have cultural affinities, which you should use in a positive way. Uh, what I want to say is that it's an illusion to say, well, leave it to them. It's something which Europe as a whole has to acknowledge. How to do it then on an operative way is something different. And I, I fully share your opinion that we have sub-regions and capacities uh, which we should use. That's the advantage, I think, of Europe, that we have this diversity. And this is often seen as a problem that we have never find a consensus or we have to push it through a majority vote. Um, I see it from more from the positive side, that this is a unique resources. And with other regions, and I have lived in Asia for many years, do not use to their advantage. That is a, a source of conflict. In Europe, I think it's a source of being more influential, having a more differentiated, differentiated approach to these uh, problems. I'm happy to hear that because at most, most of to these questions, one receives a negative, more negative vision than, than what you just said. So, so thank you for this positive note. We also had the chance to, to welcome you in Brussels recently to our event when uh, our um, the chair of our fund, uh, Board of Trust History, Orban Balaj's book was presented. So in this book, he, he showcases the Hungarian way of thinking, which is specific. So it's a little bit in a similar way where Central European states look, look upon the world and Europe. Uh, do you think that this new versus old divide in the European Union, you just mentioned that you, you, you think that this is something that can be positive and, and useful, but does, does this divide then grow or is stalemate now or is it shrinking? How, how do you see this? Well, I think we should leave behind this old division between the old European countries and the new ones. We are talking about decades already where you have been part of this European Union. Um, if you go along with this, we have many other divides between North and South, East and West. Um, I don't share this and I, we should leave it really. We should focus and we have to acknowledge, of course, that there are different traditions, different approaches. Um, it is not longer that Western Europe and in particular France and in Germany, for example, dominates the European discourse. That is something on the contrary, for example, Germany has to learn that it is not, it's an economic superpower. Yes, that's true. But political wise, we have lost influence um, and we have to see that we cooperate in a different way with our neighbors, be it Poland, 
in issues of the eastern flank, for example, with the Baltics, often ignored, tiny countries, but very important in terms of security and defense. And then, of course, the Balkan, you mentioned that. These are things um, where we have to learn that it's not longer France or the famous axis between Paris and Berlin, which matters. There is a new geography, a geometry in Europe. And I think it's a kind of statesman art to, to make use of these new dimensions. If we do not deal it properly, then it will be wedging Europe apart, which I hope will not be the case. It would be the worst case which could happen. But I think we all have to learn that Europe has changed its characters and the, the gravity has shifted. Speaking about the Germany a little bit, I know that you are staying in Brussels, so, so you're not in particular directly involved in German matters, but still due to your background, I, I must ask you these questions. How do you see the German foreign policy? When the new government, coalition government was formed, they outlined a very ambitious, sort of modern uh, foreign policy vision, and then the war came and overwrote everything. How do you, looking from Brussels in the direction of Berlin, how do you see German foreign policy in this period of crisis? Did it find, re recalibrate its vision towards Europe, or is it still in this well, it's in a process of recalibrating. Each and every government would have faced the same challenge. It's, maybe it's an interesting phase in history that a left green government is now currently facing. But we had this um, even before. I remember the secession war in, in Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia. It was also a green left government who has been forced to use military power in the Balkans. So that is not the first example. Maybe it is easier, as some say, to have this government to push through some measures. Uh, whether it's the famous Zeitenwende, as we say in Germany, a time shift or revolution will be seen. Um, it's not enough to spend more money on weapons. It's a change of mentality, a change of thinking. And what we had lost, um, partially probably as part of our history in, in post-war times, is the capability to think in strategic dimensions and to be capable to understand that other nations, uh, be it the Russians, be it the Chinese, have a different perception of the world. We do not share it. It's often against our values, but we have to acknowledge that this shapes their foreign policies and their actions. And we tried to dig our head into the, the soil, uh, to try to follow other principles, which is pretty fine. And Europe is built on on human rights, on, on law, rule of law. This can never be given up if you don't want to, to kill the European idea. But uh, we live in a world where power protection, the willingness to use military force as well, is unfortunately back, or it has never left, frankly speaking. I lived 10 years in Asia and, well, we had the many conflicts there. It has never came to an halt. Europe was an exception in this respect. And so we have to learn it quite the hard way. Um, we do not have uh, to follow this path, definitely. I think there are other ways to solve problems, but we have to acknowledge that there might be cases where we have to use these hard power traditional instruments to secure our influence or to protect our values. So, so you say that Europe, European defense cooperation is, is more than needed, or, or you say that particular member states should rediscover their, their capabilities and... It's a multi-layered approach. Um, I do not discuss the relation between NATO, for example, and, and EU. I always think that NATO remains the big umbrella for the time being without the United States and, and Canada. And the UK, we should not forget the UK, um, it doesn't work. Europe is not yet capable to defend itself. This should be a strategic goal, not against NATO, but as an important contribution and a new pillar of European defense security. Whether there will be a European army at the end or not, I don't think it's not an issue. We have other forms already found where we can integrate resources. Um, you know, this whole discussion uh, for a common market or common procurement, not to spend on dozens of different weapon systems. We have the third largest defense budget if we count all together next to the, um, the US and the Chinese. But if you look at the output, it's shamingly low. So there is a lot of practical things to be done. And as I mentioned, there is a change in the strategic culture. We have ignored for a long time the, the warnings, say, of the Baltics or the Polish, uh, that there's something in the East that we have to deal with. We didn't. We tried to ignore 
Now we have to learn it, as I mentioned, the hard way. But uh, that is one of the major uh, engines, I would say, to, to trigger closer cooperation. It does not mean that we have to do this in other fields of politics. Uh, defense is a clear issue which we can solve only together. But a lot of other fields, in, in, say, in culture or in social policy, need not to be uh, centralized or unionized. This is something I personally, or against my political background, would prefer to follow rather the principle of subsidiarity. That means giving the power back to the nation state or even lower. So, you know, Germany is a federal state, so we have a lot of competences. Even there, we have a division of power. And I think that's the only way to legitimize the European idea. Um, Europeans will not follow uh, always further centralized Europe. That means more power to the commission de facto, because the parliament has not that power it might have. There is this, this unwritten wish, wish of the parliament to... Which I can't understand, but they should not also follow this centralized issue. We have, and this discussion has to start very quickly and very urgently uh, how the future constitution of Europe should, lo should look like. Uh, we have avoided, um, I must acknowledge, even in my political family, we have avoided this discussion. What idea of Europe do we have for the future? We last, let a lot of things just happen, but we have no clear vision uh, how the future structure of Europe should look like and how to differentiate from different political parties. On the left and the green side, of course, there is the will to give central entities such as the Commission more power. And we have, you know, remember the discussion on the social policy, for example. I don't think that from a conservative liberal or Christian democratic point of view, this is the way we should follow. Going to a tricky topic to, to round up the discussion, just just uh, as much as you wish to to say in this regard, the Wilfried the Center is the EPP's think tank. So, so the EPP's position is changing um, vision or, or changing uh, approach towards things as... You witness it firsthand. How do you see the current center-right policymaking in Brussels? Uh, how do you see the, the future of the EPP? Uh, um, partly the Merz was just now in recently in Warsaw. I bring it up as a tricky topic because he met there with the ruling uh, Law and Justice Party, which is a center-right party, but not in the EPP. On the other hand, he didn't meet with the Civic Coalition, which is an EPP. A family member party. So there are some signs that, that there might be some bridges to cross in this regard. How do you see these issues? Well, the strategic goal of the EPP is, of course, to win the elections in 2024, to remain the largest party. It is an uphill battle. It's very difficult because we are equal now with the socialists. And the long-term trends, not only on the European level, but also in many member countries, is rather declining. So we have to give all what we can do to, to win. That means we have to come up with a convincing program. We have now elected a new leadership on the OEP with Manfred Weber. Uh, we will see what his priorities will be. This will be, I think, very soon decided. And then we have to see how we can transform it into a campaigning modus. The challenge of conservative Christian liberal parties is that we are people's party. So we try to cover, it's a huge umbrella. Um, and if you go through uh, the different countries in Europe, we find very centrist left positions in, in the Netherlands, for example, by a more conservative right in, in Central and Eastern European countries. So this is something which we, to a certain extent, have to be able to digest, to work upon it. Um, it is reflected, you mentioned the example of the CDU, with Friedrich Merz, it's a challenge in the German Christian democracy as well. So how to cover, we will not give up our um, objective to be an umbrella organization for a wide range of political opinions, because we think that is very central to the stability of European democracies. It is the unique advantage in the post-war times that we had been able to create People's Party that has very much stabilized um, the European democracies. Otherwise, uh, if we continue with this polarization, we really uh, give the democracy a death kiss. I mean, we, that is not our intention. We want to unite forces into the center to stabilize the system. 
Um, it is difficult, I must acknowledge. We hope that in some of the countries, we, we have elections before 2024, such as Spain or in, in Sweden, that we will gain the majority there. That would strengthen our positions also for the upcoming election process. But um, at the very end, it's an ideological discussion as well. We have to have this discussion, I'm quite convinced. And then only then we can de decide who will be part of this family, who will like to join or leave. That is also a challenge for us. So this is a wide spectrum. And for the moment, uh, I can't answer this question. We have to first get answers on certain topics. And yeah, what I mentioned, the idea of Europe, how it should look like, is very central to this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Heffler, for joining us for this podcast. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this MCC podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at korvinek.hu slash en.